In this lecture, we'll talk about internal validity and experimental research. But before we jump into that, we need to talk about the different kinds of variables that researchers study. Very simply, the most simple combination of variables that you're gonna find in most studies are an independent variable and a dependent variable. So the dependent variable is often the variable that we're interested in because it's the one that we think is caused, produced, or affected by something else. And that something else we hypothesize is the independent variable. So the dependent variable depends on the independent variable, or at least hypothetically it does. In the example in your chapter, they describe a 12-week divorce intervention that is intended to reduce depressive symptoms. So in that example, the independent variable is the divorce intervention. So that's the one that the researchers um, have created or manipulated to see how it affects depressive symptoms. So the depression is the outcome variable, and that's really the target variable in this study. We're looking to see how this divorce intervention impacts depression. So that's a direct relationship from the intervention to the outcome variable. There are also mediating variables. These, it's easy to remember the difference between a mediator and the next type I'll talk to you about, which is a moderator, um, because a mediating variable is in the middle of an independent and dependent variable. So what this means is that the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable is explained at least in some part by this mediating variable. So for example, if the divorce, the reason that the divorce intervention reduces depressive symptoms is because it creates a network of social support in the people attending the intervention. Let's say there, it's a group of them in over 12 weeks, there's sharing and, and validation and mutual support going on. Um, if the divorce intervention reduces depression because it increases social support, then social support is the mediating variable there. So that relationship between the intervention and depression wouldn't exist if it wasn't for social support. So that's the role of a mediating variable. And in this example, we would also as therapists describe social support as the mechanism of change. So social, increased social support would be the mechanism through which, through which this intervention creates change in depression. The other type of variable I wanna to talk to you about is a moderating variable. So a moderator affects the strength of the relationship between the independent and the dependent variables. Moderators are often the kinds of variables that researchers control for, such as age, sex, race, um, particular life experiences, because we wanna see if the relationship between the independent and the dependent variable holds true regardless of what we would call control variables. It doesn't mean that moderating variables are always control variables, um, but when you talk about control variables or controlling for something in a study, those are typically moderating variables. In the example of the divorce intervention, we could hypothesize that the length of the marriage that just ended could moderate the relationship between the intervention and depression. For example, the longer the marriage, perhaps, the stronger the relationship between the intervention and a reduction in depression. Or vice versa, it could be the, long, the longer the marriage, the weaker the relationship between the intervention and depression. So in either example, it could be, you know, the longer you're married, the less impactful this intervention is, or the longer you were married, the more impactful. So that might be something to control for in this study, how long were people married? Because that could affect the relationship between the independent and the dependent variables here. So how does this relate to internal validity? So internal validity is trying to correctly identify cause and effect. And this is accomplished by manipulating one variable between two groups typically, and trying to hold as many other variables constant as we can. So often, and we'll have an independent variable that has two or more groups. So it could be a group that is going through an intervention and then a group that is not going through the intervention. Um, it could be a group of 
men and a group of women. It could be a group of depressed people and a group of not depressed people. And we're comparing those groups on the, the dependent variables or the outcomes. So you can imagine that when we're trying to hold all other variables constant so that we can see how this one independent variable affects a dependent variable, this is very difficult in the social sciences, particularly family therapy, because it's very difficult to hold all other variables in a person's life constant. Um, in fact, it's impossible. And that's why, as I told you in class the first week, we can't really ever say that we have proven anything in the social sciences because it's impossible to know all of the factors that are impacting people and the variables that we're interested in. So we can find evidence for our hypotheses, but we can never really know if they're true. So what is causation? So how do we determine cause and effect in research? So first of all, you, you've maybe heard this phrase before, correlation does not imply causation. So when two variables are correlated with each other, when they have a relationship, it doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other. They could both be caused by something else. Um, so in order to determine cause and effect, a few things have to be present. And the most important is temporal precedence. And that is a fancy way of saying that if you want to test whether your independent variable causes your dependent variable, you have to design a study where the independent variable occurs before the dependent variable in time and space. So you, you have to manipulate that independent variable and then test your dependent, right? So if I measure depressive symptoms and then give people an intervention and the depressive symptoms were different before the intervention, I can't relate that to the intervention. It wasn't caused. So the, we have to manipulate the intervention, then measure depression. So A has to come before B. Um, constant conjunction means that these two things should reasonably be related. There should be some evidence to believe that these two things would be related. So in the example of the divorce intervention and depression, we have to assume that some of the, the design or the interventions within that divorce intervention are known to impact depressive symptoms. Otherwise, we would just be pulling that out of thin air. And non-spuriousness means that we need to look for other things, other factors that might be causing the change in the dependent variable. So again, both things could be caused by something else entirely. And now a causal hypothesis. So if we find in our study, right, that A seems to cause B, that hypothesis is strengthened if we can explain or demonstrate the mechanism of change. So in the example of the divorce intervention, reducing depressive symptoms because it increased social support, that's an example of demonstrating the mechanism of change. Causal hypotheses should come from theories, meaning there should be a reason why you think A will affect B. It shouldn't just come from um, common sense, it might come from literature reviews, so you might find that constant conjunction that these two variables seem to be related in the literature a lot, so I hypothesize that one of them causes the other. Um, it's also important to know that causal hypotheses are framed in terms of averages or group tendencies. So we're not saying that A causes B for every single person. We're saying that on average in this group, A causes B or on average in this group, A does not cause B. So we're not trying to predict every single person's behavior or response to an intervention. Um, and there are directional hypotheses and non-directional. And that just means, do you have a guess about the relationship between A and B? So with the divorce intervention, there's a hypothesis that that intervention will reduce depressive symptoms. So that's a directional hypothesis because we assume that it will reduce them, that it'll be a negative relationship. And non-directional would be, I think this intervention will have an impact on depressive symptoms, but I don't know if it'll be positive or negative. Now let's hope you're not designing interventions where you don't know if it's gonna positively or negatively impact depression, but it's just an example. <laughs> 
So how do we test a causal hypothesis? Ideally, with an experiment. Because in an experiment, you or the researcher controls the order of events. So you can create that temporal precedence. You manipulate the independent variable first, which is typically giving somebody one intervention or another. And then you see what happens to the dependent variable. So the outcomes that you're interested in impacting with your intervention. Now it's also important to control for other variables or potential explanations for the change in the dependent variable. And these other possible explanations are called threats to internal validity. So again, in the example from your book, uh, there was a 12 week divorce recovery program. They pre-tested, so before the intervention, they administered the Beck depression inventory to measure depression. And then after the 12 week program, they did a post test with the Beck depressive in depression inventory or the BDI. However, there's a lot of other possible explanations for any change that you might see in depressive symptoms in the folks in your intervention. One example is history. So history are things that happen to your participants outside of your study, but during the course of your experiment. So in a divorce intervention, um, participants might become more depressed if it falls over the holidays or if in 12 weeks somebody starts dating again, they may become less depressed, but there's a change in, their, in that outcome variable that did not have anything to do with your intervention. Unless of course they met their new partner in your program. Other examples of history um, would be natural disasters. So things that happen completely outside of our control and happen to everyone often in the group or concurrent treatment. You'll see in a lot of studies that when you're in an intervention study, you are not allowed to be receiving any other kind of treatment because they need to know that it was their treatment that caused the difference and not another treatment. And now of course that can make some studies uh, difficult to run because people don't always wanna give up their other treatments that might be working for them too. Maturation is uh, the idea that people naturally change and grow over time. And so you have to think about how much, over how much time do people change? So in a divorce intervention, we know that over time, people feel better, people heal. So is 12 weeks long enough that your participants are just feeling better because it's been 12 weeks or is it because of the intervention? When working with children, because they grow and mature and learn at such a fast speed, um, an intervention with children, you have to keep in mind their natural rate of growth. And so is it your intervention or is it the fact that they're just developing? Mortality, um, which sounds morbid and it kind of is because it comes from medical research. So people literally dying during an experiment. Um, however, for our purposes, we typically use it to describe people who drop out. Um, a less morbid word would be attrition. So how many people drop out of a study? Um, and the way this could affect your results is if there's a pattern in who's dropping out of your study. So for example, in your divorce intervention, if you have folks who are severely depressed at the start of the intervention, that might, they might drop out due to a lack of motivation or hope or ability to like get themselves out of the house and to your sessions. Um, and that'll impact your pre-test and post-test scores because their scores won't be in that post-test. So your post-test group will look much less depressed than your pre-test group. And so you have to look for patterns of people dropping out of experiments and try to come up with reasons for why, why people dropped out. So other reasons people might drop out, um, if the study is inconvenient for them, timing or scheduling um, or location, if it's time consuming, um, if they're not finding it helpful, they're too stressed, busy, uh, they don't have the resources to uh, participate, maybe it's taking time away from work, they can't travel to wherever the study is taking place. Um, these are things that researchers really need to keep in mind when they are designing a study is how to make this accessible to participants. Testing or reactivity is any change due to participant reactions to instruments. So 
those pre-test measures, um, if people learn anything from those or are impacted by those, and that creates change, not your intervention, that's, um, that's a threat to your internal validity or your ability to say that your intervention caused change. So in this example, um, people may, when they're filling out the post-test, just kind of answer higher um, than is really true for them. Maybe they want to show you that they've gotten better, or they like you, and they, they want to make you happy. Um, maybe they learned about their depression when taking the pretest and sought other ways to help themselves. Um, so you want to think about you want to think about are these measurements going to influence the impact of the intervention and choose them carefully. Um, instrument decay is typically only relevant when you have observers um, rather than self-report. So observers um, who might be scoring different behaviors or symptoms, they could burn out over time um, watching, say, the same videos or the same sessions over and over again. Or they can also improve and learn how to spot desired behaviors better, which might look like participants are getting better, but really the rater got better. Regression to the mean is the idea that any extreme scores at the beginning of your study will statistically move closer to the mean over time. So statistically speaking, if you started your intervention with only people with severe depression, there will inevitably be some improvement over 12 weeks. Um, so you want to start with uh, a better spread of scores. And oftentimes, researchers will exclude people with extreme scores. So if people aren't depressed enough, um, or people are too severely de depressed, they will exclude those because it might um, hinder their ability to determine cause and effect. So how do researchers manage all of these threats to internal validity? The best way is by using a comparison group. So to have two groups of your independent variable. So if your independent variable is just broadly an intervention, then you would have two groups, one that gets your intervention that you think is just great, right? Like this divorce intervention. And then the other group either gets no treatment at all, or they get some kind of a comparison treatment or treatment as usual. So whatever treatment is currently being used and you think yours is much better. That's helpful because any of these threats to internal validity that I just discussed should theoretically impact both groups equally. Theoretically. And that means any change should be a result of your intervention. Theoretically. We also have to account for selection bias, which is this idea that individuals in those two groups might be different before we even get started. And of course, this risk is higher if participants get to choose their own group because you might get folks choosing your intervention who are more motivated for your intervention or who enjoy the format of your intervention better. So random assignment is always best in an experiment. And we call those randomized controlled trials or RCTs. These are considered the gold standard of experiments. So RCTs have both a comparison group and folks are randomly assigned to the intervention group and the comparison group. Now, if you cannot randomly assign people to groups, um, or if you don't have two groups, you can use a pretest and a post-test. Um, and that can help you examine for selection bias. And that's called a quasi-experimental design. So again, an RCT has to have both a comparison group and random assignment between the groups. And there's pros to pretesting people before your experiment begins. Quasi-experimental research is often when there's only one group, you don't have a control group, and in this case, to determine the impact on the dependent variable, you compare your pretest and your post-test results. So this still accounts for temporal precedence because you've measured before the intervention and after the intervention, but it can be harder to account for threats to internal validity without a comparison group. So, Experimental research, is it all it's cracked up to be? The strengths of it 
is that we are able to rule out alternative explanations for cause and effect. And it is considered the best design for establishing internal validity. However, it's not always feasible or ethical to use an experimental design. So for example, if your independent variable is something that is inborn, um, like if we're just born this way or we can't be manipulated, then you can't really randomly assign people into groups. And sometimes it's not ethical um, if one group would be denied crucial treatment or one group would be subjected to harmful treatment. Another question of experimental research, is it actually transportable to the real world where we have a lot less control? And so these are two important concepts, efficacy and effectiveness. So efficacy is what we are trying to demonstrate in an experiment. Can we demonstrate that the intervention works in a controlled environment where we are controlling for all of these threats to internal validity? And if so, if, if, if we have a trial of this divorce intervention and it shows improvement for depression, then we've demonstrated efficacy in our lab. Effectiveness says, does this intervention work in the real world where things are not so strictly controlled as they are in an experiment? So that would be then giving the manual um, for our divorce intervention to a local agency and training somebody there to facilitate the group and then measuring how impactful the intervention is out in the real world where we have a lot less control over all those extraneous variables. And the final limitation for experimental research is that it can only be used with well understood phenomenon, which means that we have to know a lot about the dependent variable or the outcome variable that we're trying to impact. And we have to know a lot about the independent variable, this intervention that we're manipulating because you have to control everything and measure everything so carefully. So this can only be done with things that we already understand quite a bit about, whether through theory or research. Um, so when we don't know as much about certain uh, clinical issues, you would never start with an experiment. And you would actually more likely start with either an exploratory study, like a survey, or a qualitative study where you're interviewing folks to understand their experience. So an experiment is really almost, um, at the end of the line of the process of research when we've really defined a lot of things clearly.